Got a good news, bad news situation here. There's really only one reason why a clarinet squeaks, and that is because the reed is vibrating unevenly. That's what makes a squeak. Done. Bad news. There's lots of reasons why that can happen. The most obvious and the most important reasons that can happen all have to do with the reed itself. First of all, this may sound a little bit simple minded. If your reed's broken, that's going to be a problem for you. So don't play on a broken reed. If you look down and there's a chip in your reed or your reed is split, you know what? That's probably the reason. You can just change your reed. Just change your reed. But there are some more things that can happen with our reeds to make them squeak. The primary one that can cause a problem is if your reed is warped. Your reed can be warped in two ways. And the most challenging way is if the flat part of your reed, the part with the logo, the part that is flat, that lines up with the flat part of your mouthpiece where the reed sets, if we don't have a flat surface to a flat surface, there's a problem. And that's going to create a situation where your reed is, quite honestly, likely to squeak. And we want to avoid that at all costs. You're going to check your reed if you've got a problem squeaking one day. And you put your reed on as if you're going to play. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take it, put the open end against your hand, and you're going to suck in on the reed. And that's going to cause the reed to close against your mouthpiece. Check it out. Your reed should pop. The longer it stays sealed, the more flat it is, the better off it is. This reed does not have a tremendous seal. So let's sand this one so it has a flat back on it. I'm going to show you how to do that. The tools we need to flatten a warped reed are a flat surface. The flat surface I'm using here is a little, I've been using it, uh, is the bottom of an ATG uh, device. An ATG device looks like this. You wrap the sandpaper around it. You can see that the sandpaper has been wrapped around this a number of times. Probably better to use a flat piece of sandpaper, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, be sure when you are doing this that you're using a 450 at the most coarse uh, wet dry. This happens to be a piece of well used 600 uh, sandpaper. Anything more than 450, you're going to do a lot to your read and probably more than you mean to. Uh, we can always do more and uh, we can't put wood back on the reed. So keep those things in mind. I've got my reed. Obviously, I'm going to be sanding the flat part of the reed. Keep an eye on the logo and how uh, well defined it is, because that's, that's one of the things that we're going to use in order to determine if we're doing too much, too little, you know, that sort of progress. So we're going to take the sandpaper. We're going to flatten it out right here. The only caution, the only thing that you can do wrong is go too far towards the tip of the reed. We want to stay away from that when we're doing this. We're trying to get the part of the reed that is going on the mouthpiece and the rails are going to stop yeah, in this neighborhood somewhere. So we don't need to go any further than that. So we'll take it, we'll put it down and we'll just do a little bit of this. Make circles, you can make figure eights, you can do whatever you'd like, whatever your heart desires. Take it like this, you run it around like that. And then you can be able to see the work you've done here on the sandpaper. And you're going to be able to take a look here. I can see it's coming off a little bit more here than the other places. That's going to tell us that's where the reed was a little bit more uh, swollen than the rest of it. And this is going to take it down to one consistent, you know, flatness. I guess that's probably not a technical term. If I need more math, I could tell you about that. All right. I think we've got it. And uh, there you go. I've taken a fair amount of the name off. Stop there. That's a good first stop. Put the reed in the water. Right over here. And uh, let's see what we did. Here we go. Let's take a look. I'm going to do the suck test back behind the camera. We'll listen to it. A little bit longer of a, of a hold there. We're going. Pop. So I've made a marginal difference in this reed. Let's do a little bit more. Here's the other thing that you should know. When your reed's dry, this is going to have more of an impact than when it's wet. So I'm going to put it down here on the sandpaper one more time. 
do a little bit more, you're going to see the sandpaper is getting wet. That's one of the reasons it's important to have wet, dry sandpaper so you can do this kind of work. Also keep in mind, I am using very fine sandpaper. So the work that I'm doing here is not having a huge impact because we don't really want to make a huge impact. And there we go. A little bit more, a little bit more. All right, let's check this out now. Suck test, here we come. There we go, let's do it one more time. So that's holding on for quite a bit longer. This reed is now much less likely to squeak. Good work, team. Now, once your reed is sealing against the mouthpiece, it's got good suction. I call this the suck test, and I like my reeds to suck in that way. So once your reed sucks, that should solve a lot of problems right off the top. That is the most likely reason your reed is, is going to squeak. The other way your reed can warp is if the tip of your reed, if you look at it straight on, and it's wavy at the tip, that's not going to help your chances of avoiding squeaks. At the same time, your reed's going to feel pretty terrible in that condition, so you're unlikely to be playing that one. So that's really not a situation that comes up all that often. But if you look at your reed and it's wavy and you're squeaking, use a different reed. Yeah, you came here for that kind of real insight, right? So then the other reasons right up here on the mouthpiece is the way your reed is positioned. I made a reed position video and I made a video on how to work on your reeds. And these ideas are baked into these previous videos. So I'm not going to go into the long winded explanation of it here because you've already heard it or you can hear it down there. These will all be linked in the description. And if I don't say so myself, I think they're quite helpful videos. If you haven't checked them out, please do it. All right. So reed position. If your reed is off center, even just a little bit, that means it's not touching these rails evenly. And that quite understandably means it's not going to be vibrating evenly from side to side, which your reed is going to be displeased with that. And you will be displeased if your reed is displeased. It won't vibrate evenly. You're going to get some weird resistances there. Uh, it might be an interesting sound, but it is also more likely to cause a chirp or a squeak. The last thing right up here on the mouthpiece. I have found with students that I have, if they don't tighten their ligature enough, the reed's not really held on there tight enough and it's a little bit unstable. If you don't want to over tighten the screws because that's not good for your mouthpiece and that's not good for your ligature, not that great for your reed, it's going to cause problems later on. I would use the word snug to describe how the ligature should be on. But let's talk about why you shouldn't over tighten your ligature. That will, over the long run, warp your mouthpiece, which then the suck test is going to fail because your mouthpiece is warped, not your reed. You got to be careful about that. That's not something that is going to happen if you over tighten your ligature once or twice. But over the long term, if you do that as a regular course of action, your mouthpiece will warp. I've done it. I know. It happens slowly and it's hard to notice. And then all of a sudden, a lot of your reads don't work. The way to navigate that uh, in terms of diagnosis is if you try five or six reeds and you sand them down, you flatten them, and none of them are sealing on your mouthpiece, it is time to check out whether you need a new mouthpiece. And if you need a new mouthpiece, check out my mouthpiece videos, would you? Yeah, if you, and if you don't have a second mouthpiece, th that can be a challenge. I've got too many mouthpieces, so I can test it with a lot of different mouthpieces. But that's something to investigate in terms of the equipment itself. So we've gone over what can go wrong with your reed. We've gone over what can go wrong with your mouthpiece, but there are some other things that can go wrong. And those things are with the clarinet itself. Let's check out what those things are. We've got our beautiful clarinet. And one of the things that we need to do is make sure it's in good playing condition. If the pads don't close all the way, we've got a lot of pads. I haven't counted them lately. Probably 15 to 17 pads. They all need to close all the way. Any key that the natural position is the key is closed. If it's not closed all the way, 
your clarinet's not working right, it's not going to feel good, but it will also increase the chances of squeaking. If you want to know, I'll tell you how to check it. An instrument repairman will have a fancier way to check this. And by the way, I've got a good instrument repair video. Check it out. There's some ideas about what to consider in terms of how to take care of your clarinet and what to look for. I'll link that in the description too. But here's what you can do. Finger a C. So all your fingers are close. Thumb, one, two, three. You've got this open end here at the bottom. Put that on your hand, just like the mouthpiece we did. And suck on this end. You should get a little pop. That means everything is closed all the way. That's good. You can also check the bottom half of your clarinet, same way. So put all the keys down as if you're fingering with your right hand, a low E. Put it right there. You should get a pop. That means your clarinet is functioning properly. Uh, it can take a little bit of practice to do that. Your lips might hurt a little bit like mine do now from doing it, but it will give you some information on whether your clarinet is potentially functioning properly. But then when we get it all together, we got to go back to another clarinet basic, which is getting this bridge key aligned exactly right. Because your clarinet, as you know, when you put it together, has a section that goes to connect the bottom and the top of your clarinet. Now, one of the things that can go wrong, if you don't have this aligned exactly right, when we press this, our first finger down, let's say for low B flat, below the staff, F on the top line, or high D, this key needs to be closed all the way, and this ring is pushing it down. If this is not aligned properly, this might not be going down all the way, in which case your clarinet's not sealing. The pad potentially can seal, it's just not being allowed to. And we need to be careful about that. Ironically, the more fingers you put down here, the more pressure is going down on this and the more likely it is it'll close. The check on this is to put your fingers down on a C, a low C, and then press just this one finger down for B flat. Or press them all down, it doesn't really matter. And what you want to check to see is if there's any motion in this ring right here where our finger to, to play D goes down. If there's any wiggle in that when you press these lower keys down, then this one is gonna have a hard time going down all the way, which is then creating a leak in your clarinet that doesn't need to be there. Usually there's a spot here that you can find to put your clarinet together to avoid that entirely, which means then until you have someone adjust it so that there's a bigger margin of error, you've got to put your clarinet together pretty particularly. You should be putting your clarinet together in a particular fashion as a matter of just everyday life. So this isn't a change, but it's something to pay specific attention to. This goes now into what are you or me problems. Because when we put our fingers down, we can have problems if the hole's not covered all the way. Like let's say your finger in a low C, and you're not covering this hole all the way. That's gonna create a very, very strange resistance and ultimately what is functionally a leak in your clarinet. So if our fingers aren't covering the holes all the way, we're basically making our clarinet leak and it's this weird sort of resistance in the tube in the clarinet that as we play, then the reed vibrates strangely and unevenly and can cause a squeak. So our fingers, need to be precise. And if we are squeaking on a particular note, that could be a problem with your clarinet. That could be a problem with you. And it's important to be aware of that, to try and figure out which one it is. Because I got to tell you, you don't want to take the time and the expense of having your clarinet looked at by a repair technician if the problem is you. And your repair technician doesn't want to see you if the problem is you. So it's, it's good to have a sort of a clear head and an open and honest heart and assessment of what's going on there. And that's something to think about. The next two arenas that can cause challenges in terms of squeaking have to do with articulation. That's one group. And the second part of it is our air, 
our voicing, and uh, our jaw. I'm sure all this stuff. So when it comes to articulation, first of all, this is all this information is baked into a video that I made a year or more ago about articulation. The most important thing about articulation, this doesn't get really get talked about enough, is that the position from which we tongue, let's use the word properly, articulation is tonguing and slurring, the way in which we use our tongue, the movement that we utilize with our tongue, sometimes will take us out of the position that we normally play the clarinet when we're slurring or playing legato. And that can be a problem because then our voicing fundamentally changes when we articulate or tongue, that's the right word to say in this instance. When we tongue, our voicing should basically remain the same and it's just the front of our tongue that should be in motion. The voicing part of our tongue, I've made a lot of videos on voicing. If you're unclear about what I'm talking about, get clear with some of the videos I'm gonna link in the description. That's gonna make it a challenge for our read. If every time we use our tongue to start a note, our voicing is changing, that's gonna create a situation that increases the likelihood of a squeak and we wanna avoid that. We need to make sure that we tongue from the same position as we slur. That's going to take a lot of the variables out of articulation and squeaking. The other thing that we can do with tonguing that is gonna be really, really helpful is to make sure that we're using kinda of close to the tip of our tongue, if not the tip of our tongue itself, and close to the tip of the reed. It still can be the flat part of the reed, but near the tip, that we are centered in that. Because when we tongue a note, we wanna pull our tongue away. When I say pull it away, I mean just a little bit that we are pulling it away fast and it's coming away evenly because then the reed can vibrate evenly right from the get-go. And that's gonna really eliminate a lot of opportunity for this reed to vibrate unevenly and squeak. Good stuff. That leads right into our air, our voicing, our embouchure, and our jaw. Because those things can move as well when we tongue. But also, these things can move when we're changing registers or when the placement in our mouth, like let's say we go from a B with all of our fingers down, including our thumb and the register key, down to A that has just one finger down and we're holding the clarinet with our thumb and our mouth. So we go from B to A, our instrument can move in our mouth. We don't mean for it to, but it can happen. We don't wanna be clamping down on the, on the mouthpiece to hold it, but we do need it to be steady and we do need to be aware of how our finger pressure from long B to A, or let's say from third space C up to high C, where we go from lots of fingers to no fingers almost, that our clarinet is staying stable in our mouth, but not because we are clamping down on it. So that's also something to be aware of because our voicing is involved in that. There's jaw pressure involved in that, there is air involved in that, there's voicing involved in that, but we also need things to say the same in terms of where the clarinet is in our mouth. Maybe not the same, but intentionally controlled, for sure. And as just a regular way of playing the clarinet, there really shouldn't be any jaw motion in this, uh, in my book. We shouldn't be moving our jaw forward or backwards or up or down. If we move our jaw, that's going to create a lot of potential for the reed to change the way it's vibrating and therefore for a moment or two, or maybe more, vibrate unevenly. And we should be aware of that and be making intentional choices in relation to that. The last thing in all this that is maybe the most difficult thing to diagnose is our, we call it our throat, I think sometimes just casually, our throat doesn't really have anything to do with playing the clarinet, but it's our larynx and our voice box and everything in here. That can get tense. If that gets tense, it's going to throw a lot of variables in it because all these muscles are connected. It's gonna do a lot of different things, none of which are good. One of my least popular videos is about throat tension and it gives some exercises to do that are kind of fun and silly. Uh, to really help make sure that we're not holding tension in this area because that's going, that's directly related to our voicing 
and our voicing is related to our air. Our air is the fundamental thing that's causing the system to work. So we really need to make sure it's poised. We want to stay as relaxed and as natural feeling as we possibly can in that area. So these are the reasons to cause the one reason for which your clarinet will squeak, which is an uneven vibration in the reed. Now there are moments, and I got to tell you, this is true, where sometimes if we try and play a high E, we get a high A. We get the high note instead. And sometimes I tell students, Hey, you know, if I asked you to play a high A, you'd tell me it was hard, but you can do it effortlessly. And I think that that's actually one of the ways I'm not going to get into it now because it's not what this video is about. We lose a little bit of control over our clarinet. So that's where these voicing videos, so I'm going to link in the description, as you probably could guess by now, are going to really, really help you control the instrument because there are times where something sounds like a squeak. It's just an upper partial popping out that we didn't mean it to be. So we need to also be aware of that with the upper register notes particularly. So to recap, the first thing you should do if you have assessed that you're squeaking more than normal, which would hopefully be one squeak, check your reed. That is the most likely culprit. Do that every time. If your reed seems to be fine and you're still having that problem, ask yourself some questions. Am I squeaking on a particular note? If you are, I would consider checking out to see if my clarinet is working right by doing these tests that I just showed you. I would make sure to see if maybe there's a finger that's not going down all the way because that is very related to how our equipment works. Are you squeaking in a particular register? Like maybe the altissimo register. Maybe there's some voicing work to do there. Is this squeak happening over a register change? Maybe we need to pay attention to how we're holding the clarinet or how we are voicing. Those things are the most likely situation if we're going from many fingers to few fingers. Again, if your reed's working the way it's supposed to. Is this squeak happening at the beginning of a note? Check your articulation. If you're tonguing, check that out. Is it happening at the end of a note? There might be something happening with your air or your voicing. It's probably not the reed. It's probably not your instrument if it's just at the end of the note. Because not all squeaks are the same. What's causing them is the same, and that's your reed vibrating unevenly, but what's causing the cause can be quite different. And so it's important to be thoughtful, to try and eliminate these variables, and really zone in on what's going to make it so that your reed vibrates evenly. Hope this has been helpful. These are the reasons for which I believe I've squeaked. If you're still here, let me tell you a funny story. I squeaked the loudest squeak I think I've ever heard in my life. Not just me squeaking. It's not just the loudest squeak I've ever made in my life. It's the loudest squeak I've ever heard anybody make it in my life. I did it at Radio City Music Hall during the Christmas Spectacular. I was playing the bass clarinet. And let me just throw this in if you're a bass clarinet player. The bigger the reed, the bigger the squeak. And I proved it. I played a note unnecessarily loud. And it was maybe the only note anybody was going to ever hear me play on the bass clarinet in this particular show. Played it a little bit too loud. Played it a bit like a jerk. It was a low G. I squeaked comically loud. And at Radio City Music Hall, I don't know if you've ever been there, thousands of seats there. So not only did I squeak in front of thousands of people and then heard that squeak reverberate off the back wall and come back at me, I heard myself do it. And then I heard it again because <laughs> it was so loud. It's like I heard it twice. But even more embarrassingly, I did it in front of everybody I know in the orchestra. I mean, I actually saw people laugh out loud. And you want to avoid these things. And that definitely for me was a jaw issue. I opened up my mouth a little bit too much and lo and behold, I let go of the reed too much, let out the big one. It's happened to all of us at some point. Maybe not that exact thing, but something similar to that. Because it is one of the things that clarinets do that's a little bit cliche. I've got my squeak story. I'm sure you've got yours, but let's all get together pull ourselves together and identify why did that squeak happen outside of just the obvious acoustical reason that our reed vibrated unevenly. Why did it? So check it out. I, I really do hope that this was helpful and uh, I hope you're squeak free. I'll see you next time.